Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I am joined with my good friend Davon Mays from Clouds of Torah. Shalom, shalom. Um, today we are going to tackle the topic of salvation according to the New Testament, and how this whole this whole subject is really New Testament versus New Testament. Um, but before we get started, hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications. Give Davon and I a big thumbs up, and please check out the description for any resource you may need. His books, all sorts of other books, Learn Hebrew in One Hour with Rabbi Federo. And also we have a Google Doc question form down there. Submit your questions. We'll answer them. So let's get right to it. And as I change my screen over, how you doing, man? How's your week been? Good. How was yours? Good. Good, good, good. Getting a lot of orders. It's getting warm out now, so people are people are starting to thaw out. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, salvation, New Testament versus the New Testament. <laughs> so here we have a quote from an article called "The Atonement of Christ" by Mister Layman Strauss who was a professor at the Philadelphia Bible Institute. All right. In attempting an explanation of the atonement, it is important that we know something of what motivated the death of Christ. The idea that our Lord died a helpless martyr is nowhere taught in the Bible. Those who have no understanding or appreciation of Jesus Christ's work for us lack understanding also on the subject of the nature and effect of sin in all men. Many scriptures teach clearly, clearly that the atonement of Christ is an expiation of human sin, so that sin is that which made the atonement necessary. Christ became incarnate in order that he should die for human sin. Whether or not the Son of God would have become incarnate if man had not sinned, we do not know, nor do we intend to speculate. It is sufficient for us to know that it was sin which made the cross a must in the experience of the Son of God. Got a lot there. Yeah. Um. Now, off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with Lehman Strauss's complete argument because he's saying son of God. So I don't know if he's a Trinitarian, but he does say Christ became incarnate, which means he would have to have like kind of already existed, which is, you know, New Testament, of course. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, to say that he only had to be born so he could die for us. Also, I think the Philadelphia Bible Institute's Baptist. Don't quote okay. me on that, but I think it is. So he's, I'm pretty sure he's a Reformed theology Trinitarian. Okay. So uh, he had, he's saying that Jesus had to die to be this atonement. Um, well, he must have not read the complete Tanakh about that's not, Tanakh, like the Torah does not teach that people die for each other's sin or in place of each other for sin. Um, right. We do see that people die as a result of other people. Say, if I'm a drunk driver and, mm -hmm. you know, I lose self control and I drive into a crowd of people, they're going to die because <laughs> of my sin. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yep. But that doesn't mean when it's time for me to be, you know, judged that they're going to go pick up my son and kill him because of what I've done. Exactly. <laughs> and by what we're going to show in this presentation, he must have not read the entire New Testament either. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. And that, that was the second piece like, um, well, death is not the only way to, to get salvation in the New Testament. So right. yeah, he must have missed a couple of verses. Yeah, it, it's just very clear that so much basically across the board of Christianity is just fully espoused with Pauline theology. Um. That's that's the baseline view, and you can't get you can't get away from it. I mean, you have the fringe groups that aren't necessarily super Pauline, but I mean, you see right from this that the Pauline school won out. You know, it's it's Pauline theology through and through. An incarnate yeah. God man, expiation of sin, right? Nothing you can do, totally depraved. Well, the Roman media backed Paul. Yep. So. When the Romans control the media, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's like saying, yeah. you know, today's left is the ancient Roman media. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They gonna yeah, control no the kid. narrative. They no got kid. the money, the power, 
and this is what it is, you know? Right. And they'll deplatform you if you go against it. They can, they canceled the the um Abbey and Knights and they can <laughs> they really canceled everybody else who was against it. Paul canceled the disciples. The so-called pillars. You see what I'm saying? So Paul was probably the first one to start the cancel culture and cursed you if you didn't rock with him. Right. I I actually had someone tell me today. Like I post, I post most of our videos in different forums and groups, and someone told me that Paul never had. There was never any dissension between um, James or Paul. Uh, and I, I I quoted Galatians. I said, when when Paul is going after Peter in Galatians two because he's sitting with the Gentiles, and it says that members of the circumcision party arrived at the at the request of James, on behalf of James. Um, that's going to show that James was part of this circumcision party they're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And who does Paul attack from one end to the other in Galatians 3? Is the circumcision party saying they should emasculate themselves. Yeah. So does that mean does that mean Paul was okay with James if he's saying something like that when we see that James was clearly affiliated with the circumcision party? And then and we don't need to get into this, it's not really germane, but when in Acts, when Paul finally arrives and James calls him out on the stuff he's been teaching, James flexes his muscles and, you know. Paul says nothing. Paul submits. So, I don't know, it's just, people, people will see what they want to see. Well, right? I just call it cherry pick. Well, I don't call it, it's just known to that they cherry pick the scriptures. Right. They, they read what they want to read. You know, the low-hanging fruit is what they go mm -hmm. for. Yeah, and they see Paul as the apostle of apostles. So anything that kind of paints him in a bad light, oh well, you know they probably just reconciled later. Well, okay, I mean, well, because Paul, Paul is you heard of, um, <laughs> you know, what Rabbi Manoah is. I'm not familiar. So Rabbi Manoah, I, I I heard this from Rabbi Ms. Rocky. Rabbi Manoah, Ma in Hebrew is what, and Noah means comfort. So whatever's comfortable, Rabbi, whatever's comfortable with you, that's what you do, right? So Paul really is Rabbi Manoah's. Whatever, uh, whatever you want to do, that works for you, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. Paul makes it to where you don't have to worry about your conscience. Remember, because Paul says, everything is lawful for me. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so if everything is lawful, you know, you, you, you're you weak if you don't do this. Or don't, Paul has excuses for everything. To the Jew, I became a Jew. To Like, he's... He's basically uh, a shapeshifter, you know, whatever he needs to do to get the job done. He's like a spy that puts on any face to to fit in, infiltrate anything he needs to do for right. MI6, right? right? So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's James Bond of Christianity. So, you right. know, yeah, and that's yeah. and that's where we see the the a lot of his letters don't even agree. And that's oh. how you can that's how you can see that when he's writing to different places, he's kind of like assessing what their issues are and what they've written to him about. And he's giving like a, a custom catered answer to whatever's gonna, you know, work best for whomever the congregation is he's writing to at the time. That's how you know that this wasn't meant to be a compilation. These were these were just right. This is not off the top not letters. God either. Right, exactly. He, exactly. he even says, I, not God. Says, yeah, that's you know, that's he, Corinthians. He's, a, he's like, this is yeah. from my this is this is from my own opinion. This isn't right. from God. Right. It's all and in and, and like you said, the it wasn't a compilation because it took 300 years to compile. Right. You know what I mean? Like, and then it was compiled by Romans. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, come on. Did y'all right. really put this together? Like y'all didn't really and y'all didn't even really do that well. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so anyway. You know, and that that just goes to show why you know so many christians really don't they don't know more than just a few passages of the bible you know nowadays more people are reading but throughout history because the church had full control over what got taught and what people read because most people couldn't read that's why that's why so many things got eisegetically understood was because we're only going to show you what matters everything else you don't have to worry about whatever keeps you in line that's what we're going to tell you right right and that is why nowadays when people can actually study the Bible in its entirety that you have so many people leaving because they're finding the issues. Right. Yep. So the definition of 
to expiate. To make amends for, to extinguish the guilt incurred by, to put an end to M.W. That's Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster. So that's what he's stating Jesus' death was, an expiation. Well, if he extinguished the guilt, then... Um, Why do people still need to repent? Well, there's a there's a couple problems with this. <laughs> well, and and we've talked about it, but I think you have it in some other slides too. You only get one shot with Jesus. So let's say he did cleanse you, just for argument's sake. Let's let's entertain this. Right. Let's say Jesus died, cleaned everybody, everybody who believed in him, clean slate. Are you gonna tell me that every Christian never made another sin after that? <laughs> chances are it's probably not true right so that means it didn't work after that because according to hebrews 10 26 there is no more sacrifice once you sin willfully and we know that there's really not a lot of mercy going on because in the book of acts chapter 5 i believe when the people didn't give the the money that they sold their their possessions for to the church what happened they died yeah like it doesn't say it, but it's implied that the Holy Spirit killed them, right? Right. Something to, to that effect. So they didn't get no mercy. So even if they were cleansed, because of course they they became Christian is why they gave was given gonna give their money to the church, but then they changed their mind. What happened? Death. <laughs> so yep. even if this was true, you only get one shot. With the Tanakh, you get to say sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know what I mean? Like mm. And there was there was a first century cult called the uh not cult, heresy called the Nicolaitans, which is believed to have stemmed from one of the seven seven deacons, one of the seven Greek deacons of the early church called uh Nicholas. Um and they believed in this so much that it was an expiation that they believed you fully had a clean slate to sin, which means you can keep sinning. And it doesn't matter because you're covered by the blood. It doesn't matter what you do. That Jesus made a perfect atonement for all mankind. Therefore, you know, we're good. We can do whatever we want. They didn't have so, to read Hebrews. So we can actually see that the New <laughs> Testament is seemingly making polemics against that idea, right? Because if we're understanding these things as epistles, they even call themselves epistles, the letters. Letters, right. Right? So you don't write something if the issue isn't arising. So... Yeah. And if there's no book of Hebrews to contend with this, because when it was written and who it was written to is unknown originally. Now, once it got compiled in the canon, you know, 300 years later, then you could say, OK, well, people knew about it. But who knew about the book of Hebrews in the time of the Nicolaitans, if it even was written at that time? Yeah. Who knows? Or they ignored it because they obviously didn't believe it to be the word of God or inspired right. by Jesus. So And the Joannian school. The Joannian school makes a polemic against it in Revelation. So you're seeing it yeah. all over the place. The Nicolaitans are mentioned in, in Revelation. So right. it's clear that um first century they're they're dealing with big issues on what exactly Jesus' death did. Some people right. think it's a total clean slate. And on the other side of the board, some people just think it's something to bring you to repentance. So right, once again, Luke, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So once again, we're seeing over and over, first century church wasn't unified, people. No, because Paul clearly makes it very clear that um, without the blood of Jesus, you you can't get any forgiveness. But Luke doesn't agree with that because he tells us about righteous people who are keeping the law. Yeah, right, right. And if that does come from the deacon Nicholas, what does that say? That this is one of the seven top Gentiles in the entire church in the first century, and from him goes a, goes a heresy. Like, come on. If that doesn't prove how disunified the early church is, I don't know what will, right? That your, your seven top non-Jewish um, leaders are breeding heresies. I mean, that's, that's, not, uni that's not unification. That's, that's dissension, if anything. Well, so. Paul says, I hear that there is divisions among you. Well, he was a divider <laughs> himself. Right. You know what right. I mean? He, he he caused dissension between the people who rocked with the disciples and the people who rocked with him and mm -hmm. cursed you in Galatians 1, 8, 9, if you didn't believe what he said. 
Right. I'm not constantly having to tell us, well, I'm not lying. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, bro, why do you keep saying that? Like, <laughs> yeah. And like we said, if it's an epistle, if it's a letter, you're not going to address something that doesn't need to be addressed. So people are clearly calling you a liar if you have to come back and say, guess what? I'm not lying. Right. Well, if, if he just, if you quote to knock sources, then without twisting them, then what he, everything he quoted, he twisted. He yeah. omitted words, he added words. Or he just explained it so ridiculously, or he just gave a quote without no references. You know right. what I mean? He'll say, as as we read, as we see in the prophets or something, or as Scripture states, you know, like in Corinthians, where it says, "Women have to be quiet." Say, so say of the law. Now, what law? <laughs> what law it says that because to have a female prophet, uh, Deborah was a prophet and the judge. You telling me she had to shut up? Who could she ever judge or tell her prophecies to? Right. Isaiah's wife was a prophetess, went before the king with him. Like, what? Right. Hannah in the New Testament was a prophetess. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So you telling me you, you had to go to her house <laughs> to get the prophecy? She, so she was outside in the square. You couldn't ask her nothing? I mean, this is <laughs> kind of ridiculous, but anyway. The Pauline view. 1 Corinthians 15 and 3, for what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, what we just was talking about, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures. You notice there's no reference. Right. Phantom Hebrews passages. 9, so I'm sorry. Phantom passages. Phantom, right. Hebrews 9, 22. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So real quick, <clears throat> Hebrews 9, 22 needs to be broken up. I have a whole video on this, um, the misuse of Leviticus um, 17, 11, or is it mm -hmm. 17, 9? Leviticus 17, I think it's 9 through 17, 11. 17, 11. Okay, so... Um, when it says almost everything is purified with blood, this is this part is talking about like the utensils in the temple, the spoons and the forks and the the things to, you know, um, dealing with the altar and stuff like that, the mm -hmm. shovels and everything. Right. Mm -hmm. If you could purify it with fire, you ran it through the fire. But if something couldn't take the fire, you could put water on it. Right. And then, of course, the tabernacle. um certain things had to be sprinkled with blood, right? Mm -hmm. But when it's talking about the forgiveness of sin specifically, they're, then it's saying that you had to shed blood, like you have to sacrifice an animal or something of that effect. But this part is not true. And what Christians miss out on is when it says almost everything is purified with blood. Well, a lot of Christians say, well, the blood of Jesus purifies, but this is talking about utensils and things like that. Right. But then the one is talking about the forgiveness of sins. They don't understand that this is not true because they never read the entire Tanakh or they completely skipped over the verses like in Deuteronomy nine, where he says, I prayed for Aaron that Hashem did not destroy him. Mm -hmm. He didn't give any sacrifice to save Aaron. Right. So where was the blood? Right. And and he doesn't really give any context. Like he doesn't make a citation. No, um, he can't. So so if we're to understand, <laughs> yeah, it's true. So if we're to understand that under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Well, how do you kosher a kitchen? You take your pots and pans to the mikveh. That's not blood. Right. Water. Do you know what I mean? So right. if you're gonna make this over encompassing statement that almost everything is purified with blood, where do you stop? Like, what's the point where the almost doesn't cover? Exactly. You know, so I don't, it's 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 very uh, uh, very uninformative, am, ambiguous, uninformative, <laughs> yeah, ambiguous, ambiguous, right. ambiguous on what what the meaning is here. And it seems that they don't actually understand what they're saying because your very next clause and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So it would seem that they're trying to tie the two together. Well, that this is thing, considerably just atonement that he's talking about. Well, the one of the. One of the problems in the book of Hebrews is he doesn't even believe what the Tanakh says to be quoting it to begin with. And here's an example. He says that the the, the um, sacrifice of animals never gave forgiveness right. of sins anyway. Right. Yep. Well, it clearly never says in Leviticus 
when you take your your sacrifice to the priest, you will be forgiven of your sins. Right. The book of Hebrews says that that's not true. Right. So we already know that his doctrine is based off of something that he doesn't even believe in. Exactly. If if the blood and bulls of goats, if the blood of bulls and goats could never atone, then Hebrews nine twenty two has no leg to stand on. Yeah. Because yeah, without what the is, shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. But what, there was no forgiveness anyway. There was. So it, what's the point? What's the point? That's the whole thing. What is the point of your your argument when your your reference points disagree right. with you? Exactly. And you're writing this to the Hebrews, to literally the most intellectual religion out there. They're going to look at this and laugh. They're going like, to laugh. It's just like me saying, um, well, Steve said in his video and then in the interview, Steve says, I never said that. Like, right. Your reference just shot you down, bro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Right. The Luke in view. Luke 746. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who are those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I'm going to read the next one before I comment. Luke okay. 19, 5. And when Jesus came to the, the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry. And come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also since he also is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot here. <laughs> so my first question is, therefore I tell you, verse 47, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Where's the blood? Nowhere. Because Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So right. you can't tell me, well, he's going to die. Because that means if he's going to die, that means her sins are not forgiven. And it doesn't even say what type of sin she committed. Now, there's speculation that she was a prostitute or all these different things. But what right. exactly she did, you could speculate. So let's say she was a prostitute. If she would have repented, she could have repented for that anyway. She didn't need him to say, you're forgiven. She could have gone to the priest gave a sacrifice, gave some charity because yep. clearly we clearly see in, in Luke 19 and five, that that's, that's what this guy is doing. And we know in Daniel four right. 27, Nebuchadnezzar is told to give charity to break off his sins. Mm -hmm. Well, to play a little devil's advocate here in theory, she kind of did because she had this expensive ointment and she gave Jesus a foot massage with it. Right. So right. She, and in a way she kind of did give charity and he was poor. You, you right. Right. You're right. And, he and, was a nomad. Right. Go ahead. And it says her sins, which are many, are forgiven. And here's the kicker for she loved much. Right. But he who is forgiven little loves little. So love and faith are what saved her. And charity. Proverbs. Right. Book of Proverbs says love covers many sins. And it also says charity saves you from death. Right. So, so she so blood? she donates her expensive ointment and she gladly loves. massages his feet. She loves <laughs> she you know shows love and um has faith, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus says, "You know what? Your sins are forgiven. You're good. No blood." So Hebrews 9:22 would be defended how right there. Right. And for some context on how long before Jesus' death this even is, Luke 19, the very next chapter is the triumphal entry. So Luke 19 is at least a week before he dies, which means Luke 7, man, that has to be pretty early. Pretty early. He has a, his, his ministry is what, three years? So that's what, probably second year of his ministry being generous? Yeah, because in two, 
that's when he's taken to the temple and all that thing, stuff like that. And then, yeah, so yeah, I would say Luke seven because Luke has what twenty four chapters. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I would say seven is pretty early. Yeah. So I mean, you're seeing at least a year or two, maybe three before he's dead. He people are having their sins forgiven by doing good things. Right. And even if we, you know, it's neither here nor there. We don't believe this stuff is true, but like we don't believe Jesus can forgive sins regardless. But what was Hebrews looking at? Clearly it wasn't this. He couldn't have been reading this. He okay, let me let me let's do this. Either he <laughs> read this and said, yes. that's not true. <laughs> Luke is bogus, or he had no idea it existed to to right. to 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 com conflict with his teaching. Right. So but we understand the most fundamental of traditional Christians would say Hebrews was written by Paul. Right. Liberal even, would oh, say just Timothy. someone. Right. 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 So even if we say Timothy, Paul's number one disciple. Right. Did he not know Luke? Luke traveled with Paul. How could That's they? Other how, problem. How could they not share at least some similar view? That's right? what I was thinking. So I was saying, okay, so even if Hebrews read this. And Luke and Paul were supposed to be buddies. And if it was written by Timothy, even because some King James versions have at the end of it in Hebrews 13, I want to say like verse nine or something like that. It says written by Timothy, but some of them omit that part. But right. like you said, if they were all companions, they completely stopped rocking with each other at some point because there's just mm -hmm. no cohesiveness to what they're teaching. Right. So, when this guy says, um, when, when Jesus says in verse nine, today salvation has come to this house, that tells me a couple of different things. One, excuse me, there's no bloodshed. Right. And two, salvation is not spiritualized here. Right. It's, 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 uh, um, let me, re let me rephrase it. Not that it's not spiritualized, but it's not the salvation that the Messiah was supposed to bring. Right. It's, the reason it's I more, say that it's, is it's more of a leveling the scales type thing. It, it's it's the it's the kingdom within you concept because if 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 Jesus says today salvation has come to this house, right? Mm -hmm. And Z Z Zacchaeus went and told somebody, I have salvation. Well, that meant he has his own personal salvation. Right. But right. guess what? The Romans is outside. Mm -hmm. There's people outside being hung. There's the, yeah. the Romans is still taxing people. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? The right, Romans right. Yeah, it's not, it's not Geula. It's not Geula. Isn't it? Right. It's, yeah, it's not the, it's not the redemption, um, because it says in the book of Luke, chapter two, when, when uh, Hannah's talking, uh, it talks when it's talking about Hannah. I want to say like Luke two forty six. It says they were all waiting on the redemption of Israel. Right, right. So if they were waiting on a, on a, when you look up that word redemption, it says national. Yeah. It's yep. a national revelation. Like everybody's going to know it. It's not going to be, you know, and, and right. here's this, the other problem. This is interpersonal context here. Completely, completely a personal salvation. And all it is, is really some words because what type of salvation came to that house? Did Zacchaeus, did he still die? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did, were the Romans still in charge? Yes. Did the Romans still destroy the temple? When 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 Israel was exiled, do you think they said, "Oh, Zacchaeus, you there's salvation in this house. Everybody else, don't touch this house." <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like if right. you really put yeah. it in the context of what happened when he said, "Today salvation has come to this house," what did that actually mean? Right. This is being within right standing with God and your fellow man. It has nothing to do with the ultimate final redemption and the messianic age. Right. That's that's no difference from from somebody saying, "Oh, God bless this house." It it's a it's a it's a kind gesture. It sounds good, but in reality, in this situation, under persecution. Now today, you know, what I'm saying we got the freedom in America. We can go come as we please, whatever. And if somebody says that to you, it's a kind gesture because outside there's really no problem. But in right. their in their right. day, in this context, the Romans are a problem. They're killing people like uh, Jesus B Barabbas. Yes, and mm -hmm. I said that right. Jesus Barabbas. Read Matthew uh, 27, 16, and proper translations that actually says Jesus Barabbas. Uh, right. They were killing people who were going against the empire. 
Yeah. So there was problems outside. So just because his house got salvation, what did that really mean? Not much besides a kind mm -hmm. gesture coming from Jesus. Right. Right. And that, that right standing concept, um, even if it is Jesus just saying, you know what, you're in right standing with God now. You did the right thing. If that's what he's saying, you're 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 on your way to being righteous. Right. Right. What did he do? Gave to charity and repaid fourfold what he stole. You know, these are these are halakhic ideas. Right. right? This you is steal, you steal a sheep, you pay back four sheep. Right. You give charity, it's it covers a multitude of sins. You know, these this this is like I said. We don't adhere to the we don't adhere to the New Testament, but these are these are okay things, right? These, right. <laughs> if, they if are. Jesus if Jesus did say this, okay, cool, you know, this isn't out of line, but um, it goes against Hebrews nine twenty two, right? That's the whole point, right. <laughs> right? And this might be, you know, there's the there's the scholarship idea of the Q source. Maybe this is something that was in Q. We don't know. We really don't know. There's no way we can know for sure what he said, what he didn't say. All we have is what people wrote about him and the theology that goes along with it. Here and as we can see, Hebrews theology does not go along with what Luke is saying he said, period. So who are you going right. to follow? Are you going to follow Timothy or are you going to follow Jesus? Right. And, and even at the in verse 50 in Luke 7, 50, when it says your faith has saved you, what did that really mean, that she was saved? Did that mean that the Romans couldn't touch her? Does that mean she was saved from hell? Like, depending on your Christian view of what salvation is, what exactly did that mean? Hmm. What, what was she saved from? Because Paul talks about we will be saved from the wrath to come. Right. Was she saved that she's not going to die? Like, what exactly does that word mean? And when you look up a lot of the translations, a lot of times that word soter is the Greek translation of salvation. And I want y'all to look up what soter involves and who it was. Hmm. But that's another that's the conversation. Whole, the whole theological study of salvation is called soteriology. Right. So I'll let y'all have a go at that on your own because that's not the topic <laughs> right now, but it's interesting. The Mark in view, Mark 1-4. Mark 1, 4, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were bapt being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. No blood here. Mm. No sacrifices, no animals, no altars, no temple. Water. Water. Water and repentance, because it says that they were confessing their sins. Confessing their sins, yep. So if Jesus says there's none born of women greater than John the Baptist, that mm -hmm. would exclude him, right? Because Jesus was born of a right. woman, right? Right. It says I mean, John he had the Holy Spirit. He didn't make up the Lord's Prayer. Most people don't know this. Jesus did not make up the Lord's Prayer. John the Baptist did. Because Jesus' disciples say to Jesus in the book of Luke, most people quote the one from the book of Matthew, but in the book of Luke, it says, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples how to pray, talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Now, if Jesus is then relaying the prayer, what? It wasn't how his. Would, how would he know that unless he was a disciple of John the Baptist? Right. That's like saying, teach us the Psalm of David. And then he starts quoting Psalms, right? It's like, well, that's <laughs> David's Psalm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the, 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 the few problems here is for one, like I was saying, if, if John had Holy Spirit, according to the New Testament, and he was a prophet, the greatest prophet, according to Jesus, that means to, to the, from the Christian point of view, this is a completely kosher concept. And the book of Hebrews obviously didn't read this verse either because he missed right. there's no mention of any blood here. And mm -hmm. he missed that there's no mention of Jesus here. It doesn't right. say come be baptized in the name of Jesus here. So no. this tells us that baptism and your sins. Yep. evolved into a Christian idea. Because this, this baptism has nothing to do with becoming a Christian. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It has everything to do with you confessing your sins to God. It has nothing to do with sacrifices or blood. Right. And 
it's not the idea of a mikvah because the mikvah does not forgive you of sins. Right. This if is... if I can um if I can add a little Torah into this, Jump maybe in get there. a little Jump bit in there. of Torah is often called Mayim, water. Um, water has washing abilities, right? It cleanses. Uh if if John the Baptist was, you know, maybe an Essene, who knows, if if he was at least in some part in some in some practices kosher in the way he thought if he was an Essene, he had some issues but regardless they were very into immersion essenes went into a mikvah every single day um but if 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 there's any kosher aspect here that the the water the mayim is supposed to be mingled with torah because Luke 1 6 his parents were both righteous according to the torah right mm-hmm this this could be you know washing your mind washing your spirit and introspection and being you know wanting to take upon yourself the yoke of the mitzvahs i mean this is just something i'm completely off the cuff speculating here doesn't mean it's true doesn't mean it's not what i'm saying is the torah is always compared to water mm-hmm. because it has the ability to cleanse mm-hmm. um so that could be and we know from the torah that you know, turning from your wicked way is how you truly cleanse yourself. cleanse yourself and become righteous. So could there be a correlation? Possibly. Psalm 119 and 9 says, how does a young man purify his way? By living according to your word. So by right. living according to the Torah, you will purify yourself. Yes. And just for, for people who want to, you know, don't get it twisted. Most of the times the word word in Hebrew is translated as Deborah. Or Devarim, which means words. It's not Yeshua. So don't tell me that Jesus is the word because he's never called Devorah <laughs> in the Tanakh. So anyway, right. but again, Hebrews 9.22 cannot sit next to this verse. No. And Jesus is in line with everybody else to get baptized. John is specifically baptizing for sinners. Mm -hmm. So why is Jesus in line if he's not a sinner? That's something to think about. Oh, but he was being an example. He was leading by example, Davon. Yeah, an example of how to repent because he was (laughs) a sinner. Because he would have been, if he was really like his brethren in Hebrews 2, Yeah. Uh, he, you can't be like somebody if you're not like them. It says he was made like in his breath, like an, unto his brethren. Mm-hmm. By the way, God doesn't have brethren, so he wouldn't have been God, right? But you can't truly be like somebody unless you like, you know, really live among them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you can't grow right. up in Beverly Hills on the same know, plane as them. Yeah, right. And then claim that you know what it's like to live, grow up in the ghetto. No, you right. you can't. You can read books about it. But you you didn't live those nights. Mm-hmm. You didn't live it. So you can't be a perfect divine person. You can't relate to what it's like to grow up as a sinner, right? And if if <laughs> if anybody's confused about original sin, I'm on like part eleven on my YouTube page. I got I probably ended at twelve because I don't want to beat the dead horse, but right. no way original sin is taught in the New Testament, even though Paul claims it is. Right. He contradicts himself on it all the time. And so right. Jesus contradicts it. The Tanakh contradicts it. The whole concept mm-hmm. is pretty bogus, but it's it's a it's a selling point for Christianity because if there is original sin, then you would need Jesus. The problem with it is, is you have to you were born into it, right? So yeah. if Adam and Eve sinned, were they born into it? Because they didn't have parents. <laughs> yeah, right. Or did we all have capacity to make mistakes because we have the right. capacity to make exactly. choices? Free will, yep. yep. So th- it doesn't work because and that's God a... directly made Adam. So he yeah, did not inherit exactly. any sins, exactly. right? So how did he make them? Because he had a choice. Right. <laughs> exactly. And that's a segue into, in the, once again, the book of Hebrews, he was <laughs> tempted in all manners as we were. Well, if he was incapable of sinning, how was he tempted? And then the three temptations that are listed in the Gospels are nothing that any that you or I would ever be tempted with. Like, right. was he tempted as a homosexual? Was he tempted to have sex with animals? Was he tempted like 
to commit something. sin because it's cheat on his wife or any, you know, right. What I mean? That means he was tempted with every single struggle that any person in history would have like, not every, not every person that struggles with the same things. I'm sure I'm tempted by things that Davon's not and vice versa. Right. But according to Hebrews, Jesus was tempted by all of it. Mm. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Like, especially when you're incapable, what's even the point? That means That's he didn't not... have free will. I mean, right. Jesus did exactly. not have free will. Exactly. So is that, is that a God you want to follow? <laughs> like, <laughs> It's not that... fair. If you can't fail the test, what's the point? And it's not a test. It's, it's not a test. It's a simulation. Like <laughs> you're living, you're living in the matrix. Like right. you, know you can't I mean? you can't mess this up. You know what I mean? Like it's it's yeah, it's it's stacking the cards and all on one side. And if you're not, you know, it's it's and it's not relatable. That's not a religion. You it's know, not that relatable is, at all. Right. If, Je right. if Jesus was a sinner and was a, let's just let's just do this. If Jesus was a regular person, has never taught he was divine or God or anything, was a regular person, then he would be more relatable. And if right. he had a wife and children and went through some real struggles, he would be more relatable. But since he's since he's turned into this God figure and and basically and this is not on topic, but it just seems like the Romans put him to such a high degree and made him untouchable and then forced it on you that there was yeah. no way to relate to him because that's how their religions worked. Nobody talked directly to Zeus because he was out of your league. Right. They went through all these other channels, just like right, in right. Catholicism. They go through all these saints and all these things and, and you go uh -huh. through Mary and you go through Gee, everybody is, has to go through somebody else to get to God. Mm -hmm. That's what they did with Jesus. They say, you know what? Since we don't really talk to Zeus, we're going to make it to where you don't really relate to Jesus either. So they just took him, placed him above everything, and now um, he's God, and he's not relatable to you. He's not on your level, and he right. never was. Right. He was he and was distant before time, and yep. he's out of your league. And it's because of that, it's because of that, over deification that when people read the gospels they don't see stuff like this you see oh well jesus is god so you know whatever and he could do whatever he wants exactly exactly the, the they don't, they don't that, read it for the way it was meant to be written yeah right in deuteronomy 17 it clearly says when the king sits on his throne he his heart cannot be lifted above his brethren so if right. jesus was truly to be a king of israel he cannot do what he wants according to the torah right so. Right. The Matean view. Matthew 9 and 2. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Okay. So the paralytic, he's not talking to him when he says Jesus saw their faith. Now, is you can imply that the paralytic and the people's faith he saw, right? Doesn't really say because it says when Jesus saw their faith, but that would imply the people. You can include the paralytic, but it does say your sins are forgiven and Jesus has not been crucified yet. This is very early in the gospel because Matthew has 28 chapters and yeah, Matthew yep. 9 is pretty early. So again, if Jesus has not been sacrificed or crucified or executed, excuse me, Where's the blood and where does Hebrews 9.22 put this in their catalog? Right. Is it right. the is it the is it the um retroactive blood? Because you know that's yeah, it's it's not like he was it's not like he was lowered down through the roof. Jesus says, Okay, I'm gonna heal you. Now go to the temple and bring an offering. No, he says. Your sins are forgiven. <laughs> yeah. You know. And he and... saw their faith. So again, they just simply believed and their sins are forgiven. So where is the blood and why did he have to die if that's all he had to do? Mm -hmm. If all he had to do was see faith, because this is twice now. And I know a lot of Christians who hold three witnesses, right? You got the testimony of three 
That's how you make a judgment, right? <laughs> yeah. So two or three witnesses. Here's two witnesses. The first one was Luke when it says he saw her faith. Mm-hmm. Again here, he saw their faith and he forgave. Why did he have to die if that's all he needed was to see your faith? Right. He says to the paralytic, take heart. What's it mean when you take something to heart? I mean, you like hold it dear, right? Yeah, it is, it's serious. You like, I'm, yeah, that, I'm that feeling this. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, he's he's grabbing a hold of wanting to be righteous, right? Like, isn't there mean- another verse where somebody reaches out and touches his clothes and it says, "Your he faith said, has made some- me well." Yeah, he says, "Who touched me? I felt virtue." It was the lady with the, the lady with the blood disease? Right. It, so it says, again, I felt, that's three I felt, times. And it shows he's not. It shows he's not omniscient either, because he didn't know who touched him. Um, <laughs> and stop it. She <laughs> grabs. Yeah, grabs you're the gonna hem make of somebody his mad, bro. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> grabs the hem of his garment and he says, you know, "Who touched you. me? I felt virtue. <laughs> I felt virtue leave from me." Um. Yeah, everyone's touching you, my lord, is what the disciples say. And he looks down and she says, if I could only just grab the hem of your garment, I know I'd be healed. He says, your your faith has made you whole. You know, go in peace. Faith. And that word can sometimes be translated, depending on which, you know, translation. Sometimes it says, your faith has saved you. And sometimes the word healing and faith, or no, or healing and salvation is the same word. So again, my question is, what type of salvation is these th- are these things? So we see three Could different physical. times. A physical, physical salvation from calamity. Yeah. That was her, if, if she had a blood issue, that means she was physically healed, right? Yep. The paralytic was physically healed. And this implies that people who are sick is because of their sins. Right. Right. Well, that's that's. Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the blessings and cursings. You do right, right. you be right. in good shape. You do wrong, you won't be in good shape. So right? that means if we're gonna use the Torah as a, as a, as as the blueprint of if you make sins, you get sicknesses and diseases. Shouldn't you use the Torah for the healing part of that too? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it just makes sense. Like <laughs> if you're gonna use something for one way, like when it. When it when it flips, it's like, well, what 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 do you what's your source? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Right. If, if I got a medical book and it's telling me, you know, how to do something, and there's contraindications, like, okay, well, it also says don't take this medicine with that medicine. Right. Exactly. Like you you gotta you gotta you gotta put everything together. You can't mm-hmm. just pick and choose how to apply stuff, especially when you're dealing with the Tanakh. Like if this is really the words of the God of the, of the creator of the universe gave this book. And I would encourage anybody to look at a couple of different films, Torah and science. Um, right, right. There's so many different proofs of the Torah is a divine book and no man could have written it. The Hebrew language itself is, is phenomenal. It's crazy. Anyway, if you're going to use the Torah as a blueprint, use it as a blueprint. So again, right, here, right. If Jesus is forgiven sins three different times or healing people and using the term forgiven of sins and you, you have salvation. Is that what the Messiah was supposed to do? Was the Messiah supposed to come and put, put an end to diseases or was the Messiah supposed to come and put an end to wars and bring world peace? Give rebuke amongst the nations. Right. Each Torah. It doesn't really talk about him healing diseases. Right. It doesn't really say that. Right. So it's like they, they apply all, all the stuff that he was supposed to do. They ignore it. They just gave him a new job description, like being resurrected. Nowhere does it talk about the Messiah being killed and resurrected as a proof that he's a Messiah. Right. Because when you shoot down everything that Jesus didn't do, the only place Christians run to is the resurrection. Well, guess what? Right. It, it had to be God, right? It, it had, to be, it had to be real. <laughs> the well, resurrection the is the case. only I find that so funny when their position is the resurrection is the only logical explanation for the resurrection. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, what? it's the only thing that they can lean on. But the problem with that is, is <laughs> we see resurrections in the Tanakh. So that means that the, the person that Elijah and Elisha resurrected, were they the Messiah, too? <laughs> were, were they candidates like God raised them from the dead? One of those was Jonah, according well, to tradition, exactly. and right. he was a prophet so, to the Gentiles. 
<laughs> so, so he was doing your job before nations, you were. Right? You can you can use <laughs> that same argument. So if if you're going to say that the resurrection is the proof, then how do you what do you do with the other two resurrections in the Tanakh? Right. And what you going what they're going to say was, well, they didn't fulfill the prophecies. Well, guess what? <laughs> Neither did Jesus. <laughs> he was just resurrected. Oh, yep. it was the miracles. Well, I guess what you, you uh, I guess you never read uh, about Simon in Acts chapter nine, where it says he has the great power of God, which will make John three and two when it says, oh, oh, we don't we know that God is with you because only God can be with people who do these signs. Right. Well, Simon was a sorcerer. Mm -hmm. So you can't use miracles or the resurrection to to claim that that's what proves Jesus as a Messiah because he it wasn't the only it, he wasn't the only one that these things apply to. Right. He wasn't the first to be resurrected, and he wasn't the only one who did miracles. And he himself says that the 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 the, the uh, children of the Pharisees were casting out demons. Yep, yep. even your said, sons cast out demons. Yeah. Yep. By whom? Who are your sons doing this to? So he mm -hmm. wasn't the only per person casting out demons. He wasn't and the only person doing miracles. He wasn't the only person resurrecting people or to be resurrected. Because right. Elisha and Elijah resurrected people, and the people that they were oh, they resurrected were never viewed as messiahs. Although oh. I can make the argument, like like you just said, Jonah was a prophet, so he was a messiah. He was anointed, and he was resurrected. Have you ever heard people say Jonah was the messiah? <laughs> never. I've right. never heard that. Right. But if you're playing the, that game, I can throw Jonah right next to Jesus. Because he did go and preach to the Gentiles, and he was a light to those Gentiles. He even got people to repent when they was going to throw and them they off the boat. Yeah. And they were saved. What does it say? Saved from calamity. They, they yep. made vows to God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. they, first, they prayed to their gods. They didn't work. They mm -hmm. throw Jonah off the boat. Now they're making vows to Hashem. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a and conversion even, to me, right? Exactly, exactly. So, and even and even Jesus's um, miracles weren't infallible. In the book of Mark, one of his miracles doesn't work. When he's healing the blind man, he has to try a second time because the guy couldn't see after the first try. Was that he makes the spittle with the mud? Not only that. <laughs> okay, so let's we're gonna beat up these 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 miracles real quick. He tells his disciples to not fast, right? I just made a post, caused a whole storm on, on Facebook, this post about uh -huh. um, um, Jesus. But anyway, he, he says that um, don't fast, but then they go and cast out demons, and they can't do it. And what does he say? Oh, this one requires fasting. <laughs> you just told us we can't fast. Yeah. Why, why are you here? Omniscience. <laughs> Bro. Foresight. <laughs> you holding us, you holding us back, man. Yeah. You set us up for failure. You know what I mean? So anyway, um greater you said greater things that we'll do in your name, but what are you doing, bro? Like you can't can't give up the limelight for a few minutes. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, withholding information. That's so funny. Matthew 9 and 2 doesn't work with Hebrews 9 22. That's that's a 0 for 3 thus far. It's bad. Isaiah's view. Isaiah 27 and 9. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be atoned. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar as chalk stones crushed to pieces, the ashram and the sun images shall not remain standing. Okay. <laughs> he says atone that is kippur right the day of atonement yep the mm -hmm. fruit to take Kippur. away his sin who is his is he talking about a person or is he talking about israel corporate this israel. is isaiah yep jacob corporate right. israel when he makes all the stones who's the he is it a one person or is it the nation the nation of course because i i know y'all know i'm referring to isaiah 53 when it talks about he and his right <laughs> so if an Isaiah 27 is talking about he and his and it refers to the nation, is it possible that Isaiah 53 is doing the same thing? Just just a question. Just a thought. You know, but when it says he shall make all the stones of the altar as chalk stones and crushed to pieces, the ashram and the sun images shall not remain standing. 
I don't see any blood here because it basically says when you get rid of your idols and destroy yep. them, your yep, sin exactly. will be taken away and iniquity toned for. Because we know because there's a difference between, I'm sorry. Right. I was going to say, because that in itself is its own form of repentance. You Period. are destroying the evil and turning to the good. Right. In a very literal sense. And there's a difference between iniquity and sin, technically, because there's intentional and unintentional sins. You right. can make mistakes out of ignorance, or you can say, you know what? I'm not listening to God. Right. You know, I'm running that. I'm going to run that stop sign. I see it and I'm running through it. Or dang it, I didn't see the stop sign. It was a tree. I wasn't paying attention. It was unintentional. I did not mean to run that stop sign. Or I see it and I don't care. I'm not stopping. I don't want to. (laughs) I'm in a rush, whatever, right? right? right. There's a difference between intentional and unintentional sin. So those are both covered by taking away the sin from when when you get rid of your idols. Mm Mm-hmm. And we know Israel had problems with idols. All the nations had problems with idols. That's where Israel learned it from. Right. Right. So. Well, just one example. One example of how you could have an intentional and an unintentional sin if there's an idol in the room. A Jew cannot bow before an idol. Right. Look down your shoes untied. There's an idol standing in the room and you just bent down to tie your shoe, not thinking about the idol. Well, guess what? You just unintentionally bowed before an idol. You if that idol wasn't there, it wouldn't have been an issue, right? Mm-hmm. So it just goes to show that you get rid of the idols and you kind of just got rid of a whole lot of problems. <laughs> a whole lot of problems. <laughs> you know, intentionally and unintentionally. It's, it's, the Tanakh is so very logical. Like, if you just check yourself, be mindful of what you're doing, you're going to be in good shape, you know? Paying, paying attention is so valuable in, 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 the, in the Torah's view of things because... And and of course, in every ph- philosophical school, there's wisdom. Like you can get, you can get your shoes tied from a monk, right? right. But he turns around, he's bound down to an idol. Not all monks, but there's some monks who, of course, that you know, there's, there's idols all over their temples. Mm-hmm. You know, you could talk to any, you know, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, you know, even atheists. They're, they're they're some of these are brilliant people, scientifically and stuff like that. But at the same time. The logic in the Torah just makes sense that you don't have to be a Jew to understand it. Right. You can pick up the book and read it and be like, that makes sense. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is very logical. Why right. would I think something that a person created is God? Exactly. The sun image, right? Somebody made an image of the sun. That means they took some dirt, some clay, took the time to bake it and all, whatever they had to do to create it and, and put it up, and you're going to bow to it like, that can't be God. If anything, you should worship the person who made it, right? <laughs> Which is a man. <laughs> As long as you know, right. you bow down to a person. And it's like, well, his mother made him. So you really should be bowing down to his mother. Well, her mom made her and so on and so forth. So, you know what I mean? It, it's going to lead back to a person, which is going to lead back to, well, who made the first person? God. That's who exactly. you should be giving your, your, exactly. your credit to. So mm-hmm. the, re, the, 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 like you said, the logic behind all this stuff. So if, if, Getting rid of idolatry is is how you atone for your sin. Where's the blood? Hebrews 9.22. Right. Yeah, and even Judaism concedes that idolatry was born from worshiping intermediaries, whether it be worshiping yep. the sun. Stars, worshiping, exactly, exactly. Deuteronomy um, 4 clearly talks about that. Exactly, and it's not that it was necessarily... Um, not that it was necessarily meant to be evil at first. It was just they they misunderstand. Like, like always, misunderstood and saw God as too big. So you worship, you know, lesser, lesser creations of God, and eventually it turns into a full blown pagan religion. Yep. What's Jesus? An intermediary. That's that's Laid, I think that's Hebrews too. It's laid laid out that he's the mediator of a new covenant, a go-between between us and God. Yeah. Right. And that's exactly how idolatry got its start. And that's that's the whole point is you don't need that um inhibited worship. You can go right to the source. And that's that's the golden calf. That's everything. That's that's the issue, is feeling the need to have an intermediary, and we've talked about this before. Between us and our creator. That was never the intention. 
Well, let me devil's advocate. So the Christian is going to say, well, the priesthood was the intermediary because you had to take your sacrifice to the priest or, you know. And so the answer to that is, yeah, you took your sacrifice to the priest because that was the penalty. Just like today, when you get a right. ticket, you have to go pay the court. Well, who mm -hmm. do you repent to? You don't repent exactly. to the court. You yeah. repent to God. Let's say you killed somebody on you forgot God forbid, right? And you got to go to jail. Yeah, you have to go deal with the court system. There's the intermediary, intermediary, right? You have to deal with the people in the court. But you don't pray to them. You can ask them for forgiveness, but you're praying to God that you yeah. took a life. Right. So yeah, you might have to pay a fine to the court which is the priesthood at the time, but that's mm -hmm. not who you're giving your prayers to. That's not who you asking for mercy from. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's leveling the scales in two different directions, horizontally right. and vertically. Right. And that's, you know, that's the priesthood was just the court system. If you want to look at it from right. a, 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 right. a real easy, easy point of view, they were simply the court system because it says when something mm -hmm. happens, you have to pay the fine according to what the judges allow. Right. Right. But again, when you make your prayers and your and your repentance, you're not repenting to them. You're telling Hashem, right. I'm sorry. Exactly. Yeah. And social so, justice is so right. important. Uh, even the Ten Commandments, thing. you have five vertical and five horizontal, five that have to do with your creator and five that have to do with fellow man. Right. And the horizontal is so, so important. For example, I don't see God walking around in here. Right. He's he's invisible at the real, you know, you can't necessarily understand the consequence when you're doing it. You can't. I mean, we're we're imperfect beings. We can't feel God's pain when we sin, right? We can't always see see the end game of what we just did and how it affects our spiritual life. But if you go down the street and shoot somebody, you watch them die and you watch their family run out crying, right? You can. You just ruined all these lives. It just goes to show that the horizontal has a very instant consequence, and it's so much more apparent. That's why the way we interact with other people is so vitally important, and I think that's really what you were getting at, right, is is leveling the scales in the horizontal is of the utmost importance, kind of even more so than the vertical at the time. Right, right. right. Dealing with people, because you have to deal with the people first. Actually. And I heard a rabbi say this. I want to say again, it was Rabbi Mizraki. He said he asked somebody about a court case. And the, his rabbi told him, he said, you know why we have a court system? Because people don't trust God. Hmm. Basically, wow. the court system is our way of telling on each other because we don't want, we don't believe that God's going to take care of it. Hmm. Wow. I said, wow, okay. Cool. Like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So anyway, Isaiah's view does not Oops, rock. Sorry. What Hebrews Sorry. nine twenty two? Are you good? Isaiah Isaiah twenty seven and nine doesn't work with Hebrews nine twenty two. Definitely not. Oh for four. James's view. James five nineteen. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I think this is one of the reasons the church did not like James. I'd say so. Or Paul. Because remember, <laughs> right. James and Paul didn't, you know, they, they didn't see eye to eye. Where's the blood at? Because bringing somebody back, you know what I mean? Let's say they're a sinner and you get them to stop sinning. This would be Ezekiel chapter three, where it says you got to right. warn somebody of their right. sins, right? You will save his soul. And if you don't listen, you saved your soul. Mm -hmm. um, and you will cover a multitude of sins. Well, if only the blood can cover sins, what exactly does Hebrews do with this verse? <laughs> and where did James get this idea from? Right. If if James is echo if James is echoing Ezekiel, he's he's bringing up a two person atonement here. By you going about by you going out of your way to bring said person back is an atonement for yourself, mm -hmm. and by you, and by you bringing the person back is an atonement for the person because they now repented and turned from the evil. Oh my goodness! Where's the Ooh, blood? We. <laughs> what do you do with that? And see, I want y'all to know something too. 
when when me and Steve put these slides together, we don't just try to attack the New Testament. We even try to bring the arguments when we when we give our commentary on it to try to save it. Mm-hmm. Because that's why I always say, well, the Christian is going to say this and the Christian is going to say that. Because as a Christian, we we had to deal with these verses. Right. We had to actually yep. say, dang, well, this doesn't work with the Tanakh. This is a contradiction. This this doesn't make any sense or whatever whatever the situation was. So when we bring these to the table, we always bring the other side of the of the argument. That's why we devil advocate each other and mm-hmm. things like that. Like we're trying to get you to make the best decisions. Right. This is this is not just us attacking the New Testament. This is us remembering when we was Christians, how we looked at it and how we look at it now. And as a Christian, I try to clean up the verse. I try to. And even now, when I bring arguments against the New Testament, I try to say, if I was a Christian, how would I respond to this without just giving my opinion? If I, if I could go into the New Testament to fight this verse, what would I come with besides going to Paul, which is going to contradict it, but besides going to Jesus, which is going to contradict it? Right. And I just, you know, now I'm fighting against myself. Right. And then at because, the end of the day, if, if you have to then weigh the two sides, then you have to choose James's view because James is the top dog in Acts when it comes down to disputes, which means if this is the same James, then who are you going to side with? Jesus' own brother or some guy that never met him? And if this is true, if what James says is true, what would make the writer of Hebrews even write this? Because they both can't be right. Because there's no blood in James 5.19, right? And let's say this is written after the temple was destroyed. There's no sacrifice that could have even taken place because in Deuteronomy 12, it tells us you can't make a sacrifice and stuff, you know, unless this is the place that I chose to put my name. So the whole argument of you can't make sacrifices because there's no temple. So let's say James is written after the temple was destroyed. James is not referring to any type of sacrifices here. He's just basically saying, you telling somebody, hey, bro, you shouldn't do that. You should start studying. You should repent, whatever. And you save this person's soul from death. And now you just covered your own sins. Mm-hmm. James doesn't even tell you anything about Jesus here. And now and I'm going to really say, drop well, he was a Christian and he probably put that in his sermon to save the person. Let's say he did. Let's let's speculate that he says you need to give your life to Jesus and all this stuff. Right. <laughs> right. Even if that's true. It just says that this act will cover your sins. It doesn't say because you did ABC with Jesus or his blood is what saved you from a multitude of sins. It just right. says by bringing somebody back out of the out of their sins. Exactly. And now, like I said, I'm going to really drop a bomb because Christian tradition is the temple wasn't destroyed until 70 because it was being preserved in the merit of James. And it wasn't destroyed until he died. Which means if this is legitimately from the hand of James, it was written while there was a temple. Which means he could have very easily said, bring a Korban Hatas, bring a bring a sin sacrifice. Doesn't even mention it. Nope. Doesn't even take a second to mention it. And if this was penned by the hand of James, there would have been a temple standing. <laughs> so there you the New Testament versus the New Testament. I mean, we 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 gave some Torah sources, but overall, we showed that the New Testament doesn't rock with each rock with each other very well, and we even showed Torah sources that completely agree with some of the New Testament sources that disagree with the other New Testament sources. Right. So, what did that and, tell you? And we can't we can't deduce either that oh well James didn't even if there was a temple standing James knew that Jesus was the last sacrifice. Well, that's not true. Because in Acts, James has four Nazarites go and null their vows with sin sacrifices and makes Paul pay for them. Yes, so clearly, in front of everybody. In front of everybody. The sin, the sacrifice that goes along, like the offering you bring when you end the Nazarite vow, is a sin sacrifice. Um, James doesn't mention that here. James doesn't even bring it up. James doesn't bring up a sin offering, even though we understand James didn't believe Jesus was the final offering. Which means he simply just believes, as Ezekiel 18 says, if you turn from the bad and start doing the good, you're you're in good shape. Period. 
So that's 0 for 5, right? Bad. Hebrews cannot have that. Hebrews 6 and 4, it is impossible. For it is impossible in the case of those who have who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Let me highlight this. Wow, it is impossible. Now, Steve, nor I, (laughs) <laughs> wrote the book of Hebrews. Just, yeah. I, <laughs> I just knew it was give coming. A <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> I just want to say that, man, because this <laughs> we didn't write it. Good. <laughs> this is not good. For it is impossible in the case of those who have been, who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. It's impossible since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to to those for whose sake it was cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Hmm. So you get one shot. You can't crucify him twice. That's the that's the point here now here's the second witness because two or three witnesses right that's all you need for christians you know what i'm saying they stand on this right mm-hmm. hebrews 10 26 for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries so whoever wrote hebrews was one shot, one hitter quitter. Yep. Once you became a Christian, you can never make a mistake, y'all. Mm. Now it says deliberately. Deliberately. Now, Jesus tells his disciples his disciples that if somebody sins against you, forgive him 77 times, right? If somebody sins against you 77 times, that sounds deliberate. Yeah. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But 77 times, I think you don't like me. Actually, <laughs> I think you hate me. You're intentionally no, no. doing it's something. It's 77. It's 70 times 7. That's 490 times. Oh, for, for, pardon me. <laughs> pardon me. Pardon me. So that even that's even worse right so if jesus is all has all this forgiveness of your brother deliberately sinning right here it says for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice and it's impossible to bring you to repentance hmm. that's not that's not any mercy right there cuz it says God's mercy and his loving kindness endures forever. There's a chapter in Psalms that like says that a lot of times for his right. loving mercy and his loving mercy endures forever. Something, something, something for his loving mercy and <laughs> endures right, forever. Right. So Proverbs, the righteous man falls seven times and rises, but stumble, the wicked stumble over sin. So, you know, we're not saying that, you know, this is like, um, a problem we're saying that this is a nuclear problem this is like toxic to the the, to the to the christian doctrine like the book of hebrews is very bad like of all the books of the new testament this one is kind of like this is the heresy of heresies in the new testament like Mm -hmm. i can pick on paul a lot but just the book of Hebrews alone, I think, might be worse than all of Paul's letters. Honest to God, I, I don't think I know a single Christian by this standard that's going to heaven. I don't think I know nobody could one. ever make it to heaven according to Christianity. I don't think I know a single one. Nobody, including Paul and Jesus, because guess what? They both made sins. Mm-hmm. Paul even claims to be a liar. Paul changes doctrine. Paul omits right. verses. Like Paul is a he's not the 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 best guy as he's presented. 
and you know well if this was timothy he learned from the best of them he learned from the best you know and um yeah this is bad so it's impossible right to get salvation after you know jesus once so that means you can never mess up mm -hmm. never it's impossible now that's a very heavy statement so that means all those Catholic priests that was messing with them little boys. Yeah, they're done so. They can't repent. Nope. All the pastors that have cheated on their wives and stuff like that here recently. When you cussed can't. your mom out on the telephone because she did something you didn't like. Right. Sorry. You're you're done. Doesn't even have to be it doesn't even have to be like a crazy sin. It just says if you're sinning deliberately. Right? Yeah. It's not saying a capital sin here. No, just a deliberate, just, just a deliberate sin. It was tempted with a million dollars and you stole it. It was deliberate because you don't accidentally steal a million dollars. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> you you got to think about that. Like, man, I'm going to jail for the rest of my life if I steal this much money. Right. I know so now, people. I mean, now you're starting to understand why Paul and Thessalonians said, you know what? Just stay home. Don't listen to anyone <laughs> but me. Like, you have no shot here, you know? <laughs> right. So there you have it, guys. I mean, I think this is the last slide. Right there. Oh, That's the last one. Go. Okay. What God, God really wants. Ezekiel 18, 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and that and not that he should return from his ways and live? Oh, man, that what a comfort in knowing that I can say I'm sorry mm -hmm. and that my sins will not even be remembered against me. That I have the possibility of saying my bad. And it says in his righteousness, that means I become righteous once I repent and do yep. what is lawful and right. Mm -hmm. Because God has no pleasure in killing the wicked, but that they should live. Such a powerful chapter, man. It really is. Such a powerful chapter. And um, what was on Ezekiel's mind when he wrote this? Because hmm. it starts off with a proverb talking about people dying for their parents' sins. Yep, yep. Same thing as in Jeremiah 31. Exactly. So no, you are responsible for yourself. You are the basically the author of your book. Right. Now, you know, Jeremiah 31 to me is the chapter that ultimately destroys the Christian claim because Jeremiah uses the same proverb about mm -hmm. the sour grapes not mm -hmm. you know there's the that that uh sin guilt isn't passed you're mm -hmm. you're responsible for your own and then he goes right into the new testament narrative the new covenant right he goes right into the new covenant so the preface to his new covenant is that your sin guilt is on you <laughs> and then he talks about the new covenant well you know what they do That's so the antithesis to the new testament so the Christians will quote Jeremiah 31, but they start at verse 31. Right, right. Why wouldn't you start at verse 1? If you're going to quote Jeremiah it's 31. It's because, the, it's because the book of Hebrews starts at verse 31. Right. And it's because 1 through 31 is talking about a messianic age leading up to the new covenant. Yep. And it yep. says in 29 and 30, mm -hmm. you will, in those days. In those days. Says, in yep. those days, you will die for your own sin. And then it says, behold, I bring a new covenant. Mm -hmm. So what, when did the part of you die for your own sins come into play? Either it <laughs> existed prior to the new covenant, or it's going to be the condition to give the new covenant. What do you do with that? I'm saying. Oh, you ignore it. That's what they did. That's why he doesn't quote that part. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying very Jeremiah easy. 31 is Jeremiah 31 is like the Christian kryptonite, man. Like that is it, yeah. If if anyone truly like if if you want the the if you want the full 
full-fledged deliciousness of answering the question of, is the New Testament the new covenant of God with his, you know, read Jeremiah 31 from beginning to end, and you will come to the realization, like, this is just absolutely the most opposite of what is presented in the New Testament. On top of that, it says that nobody will teach their neighbor about God. Well, if right? we're under the new covenant, what are missionaries doing? That's true. That's true. They're out here teaching, which means that, that's that's the most. That's, that's one the of the opposite. most. That is not even a Christian would concede in the messianic age there would be a worldwide knowledge of God. Every Christian would concede that. I can almost guarantee you that. Um, well, it's not where happening. Where's it at? Not happening. Well, there you have it. The New Testament versus the New Testament on top of being, you know, the opposite of what the Tanakh talks about concerning repentance and the forgiveness of sins. There's no blood. And guess what? Ezekiel was writing to the exiles. That means these people wasn't even in Israel. Well, some of them weren't. Because you can right. argue he, he, he started preaching. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. He was exiled first. Well, well, see, if he was exiled first, because I was going to play devil's advocate, maybe he was preaching to people, then he went into the exiles, or he was in Israel. Let's say he even was going back and forth, right? Just for <laughs> argument's sake. The temple was under siege. The land was under siege. The, the, when, the, when, when they would, in ancient times, not even in ancient times, even today, when uh, there's a when there's an army surrounding the country, they're cutting off trade routes, they're cutting off yeah, supplies. Yeah, points, points to so, starve you out. Right. So nobody was worried about taking sacrifices to the temple when there ain't nothing to eat. They're going to keep that goat. <laughs> well, that's I mean, that's that's like half the point of Isaiah seven. That's why they all missed the point. They, they like, completely what, missed when the you're, point. When, right. when your city is at siege, you're not drinking milk and you're not eating honey. You're you know scraping you're scraping the bottom of the barrel for the last drop of water and the last morsel of bread. Right. So luxuries. Even if, right. So, so right. So even if people want to argue, well, he was talking to people who were still in Israel. They wasn't concerned about going to the temple to take a sacrifice. They was trying to keep as much food as they had just to stay alive. Because right. Nebuchadnezzar uh, surrounded the city, and they were under siege before the temple was destroyed. So they had there was a lot of yeah, time like that a went whole on. Year, I think. Yeah. It was a, yeah some time. Might even been longer. Went by. So, but even though it does tell us he was talking to the exiles, his message overall to the exiles was repent. Because mm -hmm. they even asked him. And I want to say in Ezekiel. 27, 37, one, mm. of, one of the chapters. 27 might be, sounds right, because that's right. Maybe 33. The... Any, mm. Anyway, the point is this. They said, what can we do? Our sins are upon us. He said, repent. <laughs> he <laughs> didn't say, oh, there's going to be a, a guy right. born in 500 years. And, you know, he didn't say, you better go to the temple. He said, repent. They say, what shall we do for our sins are upon us? Mm -hmm. Repent. The same message, repent, repent, repent. Job 36, repent. Jonah right. 3, 1 through 10, right. repent. Ezekiel 18, repent. Mm -hmm. Shoot. Uh, and then only fuck. just a, a few years later in exile, Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel, like, what am I supposed to do to receive forgiveness? And he says, you know, give charity. Charity, man. And that's a non-Jew. That is a wicked non-Jewish king who just destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And Jer what does Daniel say? Give charity. He don't say, Nebuchadnezzar, you got all the cows and sheep in that at your disposal. Sacrifice all of them. No. Charity. What does John talk about? Mark 1, 4, the beginning of the book of the New Testament, the first one written according to scholars, for the, at least the first gospel. Mm-hmm. He doesn't say anything about no blood, man. He says, repent, confess your sins and dip off in some water. Right. Go swim in and say, I'm sorry. You want to know something funny? I was thinking about the other day. You just brought up Mark. When, when This is totally off topic, but you just reminded me of it. When Christians always say that, oh, yes, the Gospels are eyewitness accounts. Um, Mark is supposed to be John Mark, the traveling companion of Paul. Mm-hmm. Doesn't even show up until Acts 12. <laughs> so how, how could that guy be an eyewitness? Ooh, I don't, well, know, I don't you know, know what made you I don't know what made me think of that, but I just found it so funny. I was like, even like even Christian scholars can see that if John Mark was the author, it couldn't have been written any sooner than 
five years after Jesus was dead. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was an eyewitness of counts, uh, eyewitness of count of hearsay. Yeah, he said yeah. he saw. He right. said she said she saw this. So you, they're they're journalists at this point. So there you Sorry have it, guys. Tangent, but I found that funny. Yeah. All right, but everybody, Dave on Mays, Clouds of Torah. Check out that YouTube channel, uh, the Original Sin series, Going Strong. Great stuff. I was, I was actually, I listened to two or three of those today. It's, it's good. Nice short format, and uh, man, a well of information there. And it's, it's to knock New Testament, you know, very similar to what he and I do here. Um, and that's not even counting all the other hours and hours and hours of content he has on there. So everyone, please check him out. Check Clouds of Tor out. Hit that subscribe button. Um, check the description. His books are linked down there. It takes you right to his Amazon page. Um, if you had to, if you had to uh, suggest a book for someone fresh out of Christianity or someone thinking about leaving, what would you say? Um, to be honest, I would recommend Let's Get Biblical by Rabbi Singer because I have those books and um, he actually is, it's, it's funny because he's actually responding to people's questions. Like people have right. asked him questions and right. he puts like the, the question in the book and kind of like deals with it. And um, it's very uh, practical. Like it's very, it's very, um, simple the way he deals with it i give a lot a lot of references like in my books i give you so many references to, to a lot of ammunition his is very short and to the point but yeah. his, the is, his he, is more like an encyclopedia i have both his volumes too right. and they're very his much is like an very encyclopedia powerful because he yeah. and a lot of people a lot of people don't know this rabbi singer knows the new testament better than any christians I, i've ever talked to oh 100 percent. so 100%. The, his response to certain questions are very direct and very simplified. So I would say for a beginner, definitely let's get biblical with Rabbi Singer. Mm -hmm. I have That's to give my love be. to Stuart Federo too. If if you can't, if you aren't really into that encyclopedic format and you want to just understand how Christianity and Judaism differ, Judaism and Christianity a contrast breaks it down very very simple. Also, so if you could grab those in tandem. Please do. Um, and like I said, the uh, my, my go to if I was if I was going through your your catalog, definitely got to start with the false false citation series, the citation fulfillment. It's just, I mean, what can they? What else can they do with that? You know, I mean, it's that's why I wrote it that way. Yes. Yeah. That's that's what really. There was other things, but when I wrote the false fulfillment citation series. It was really me showing how if you had a, a missionary trying to pull the wool over your eyes and saying, well, see, Jesus is here. Jesus is there. The top 10 false fulfillment citations are addressed, and there's no way you can put Jesus in there if you read them in context. Right. So cool. definitely would recommend my books, but I wouldn't say mine's are for a beginner because they're so heavily referenced and um uh, uh mine's uh, are for people who actually study a lot. Right, right. There's a book, there's a book in linked to my description called Leaving Jesus. If you're a if you're a just, you know, kind of got questions and you're fresh fresh out, check that one out. I think that one's very inspirational and you'll enjoy it. Leaving Jesus. I, it might be one of the first ones in my in my uh description down there. Yeah. But yeah, Davon, as always, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate I you having me. Um Y'all pump Steve's channel has got a lot of good co content on here. Um, and um, he's very consistent, puts out a lot of information. Um, like he said, his format is good, straight to the point. Um, some videos are shorter than others, but there's they're still packed with content. And uh, he's working, y'all. So um, <laughs> uh, show him some love. Give him them thumbs up and, uh, um, you know, make some good comments, you know. Um, and please, and I've said this before, please don't say Jesus is God. If that's your response to everything, it's like, that's not even a response. It's yeah, like yeah. address the verse, show where you differ, you know, give a contradiction, whatever you're going to do, but don't just make statements. Jesus is Lord. And, you know, and put a bunch of exclamation points behind it. You know what I mean? Like, Jesus is not, Lord. 
that's not yeah. doing nothing. You know what I mean? Right. You're not enlightening nobody with saying stuff like that. Like show, if you disagree with somebody, show something and don't write a four page letter either. Nobody's going to read all that. Like make the point, show the verse, why you disagree, show a verse to contradict or whatever you're going to do. But just like, you know, if you teach somebody something, don't just make statements. Like we're here to like try to expose everything. So, you know, get to it the right way. Don't just make, you know, uneducated statements like right jesus right. is god you're going to hell like okay. <laughs> why <Yeah. laughs> you know what i'm saying okay. Just tell me tell me what i did you know what i mean mm -hmm. so right but all right my friend um like we said guys dave Almay's clouds of torah and uh can't suggest it enough but everybody until next time, this was the Exodus Project. I'm Steve Eisenhower. We'll see you next time, everyone. Mm -hmm.